You're listening to Financial Advisor Marketing, the best show on the planet for financial advisors who want to get more clients without all the stress. You're about to get the real scoop on everything from lead generation to closing the deal. James is the founder of TheAdvisorCoach.com, where you can find an entire suite of products designed to help financial advisors grow their businesses more rapidly than ever before. Now, here is your host, James Pollard. Financial advisors, welcome to another episode of the Financial Advisor Marketing Podcast. One of my goals for 2023 was to have more guests on the show. This is not necessarily going to be some guest extravaganza. Maybe I'll do a guest one week and then back to a solo show the next week. But the uh, one of the guests that I have here is Steve McClellan. Uh, I'm going to let him take the floor and talk about his journey. The title of this episode is most likely going to be Financial Advisor Shares What's Working for Him. And since this is the Financial Advisor Marketing Show, I figured it would be great to have a financial advisor on here talking about his situation, his journey, his circumstances, and all that comes with it. So Steve, I'll let you take the floor and share whatever it is that you want to share about your background and how you got to where you are today. Okay, thanks, James. I appreciate it. I, I've got a couple of hours here to to share my story. Oh, all right. <laughs> Start with the day you were born. Yeah, no, I'll cut I'll cut to the chase. You know what? I had a a pretty good uh childhood. You know, it's grew up in a, a little town called Anaganish, Nova Scotia, a very university town. My dad and mom was a teacher and a nurse, and they kind of always gave back to the communities, but never really thought big, right? Um, and anytime I did have a kind of a big idea, it was always told odds oh, up. Pretty much been done before. Uh, so I kind of just not really sure, like so many people, what they wanted to do. Good at math. Guidance counselor told me to become an engineer. So I went down that route and uh, always had a vision that I wanted to do something better and bigger in life, but just not really sure there. So I just kind of floated. And then in my early 20s, kind of introduced to alcohol and women and probably floated even more, even though became quite successful with my engineering career going all over the world. But um, Something happened to me in 2008. Well, really before that, um, I don't know. I, I'm sure you deal with it a lot. You see it with your clients, you see it with other advisors. They're not really focused. They don't really want to know what path they're going down. And, and that was definitely me. And I came across this uh, beautiful blue-eyed, uh, blonde-haired lady who had no interest in me whatsoever. So I realized that I had to uh, pick up my game. She helped me focus on what's truly important and, you know, start focusing on my career. And I just get a, a pretty good reputation. But you ever notice when you, you you try to make massive changes, the world seems to push back? Absolutely. Every time. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what kind of happened to me. 2008, 2009 came by. I lost my job. Don't need to go too much detail on that, but pretty easy decision for the the company I was working with. I was one of the higher paid engineers with the least amount of experience in my in the field. And with that, all the bar stool of financial advice I was taking from friends and HR departments, my stocks were down. It took me about nine months to to find a friggin' job. And during those nine months, it wasn't for my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and a guy who was in the landscaping business. I have no idea what I would have done. So I made myself a vow to the moon and stars that once I did get the income again, I would never put myself or those that I love in that financial situation again. So I took my financial life much serious. I actually got a financial advisor, worked very close with him. And then in 2014-ish, 2016, really, when it all came to a head, I moved back to my beloved home province here in Nova Scotia. Where we decided to really ban um, onshore oil and gas exploration. Again, another chat for another time. But my my career came to a screaming halt. It really was career suicide moving back here. This time, cost of living was a lot higher, mainly due to tenancies. Uh, we had most to feed. We had uh, a newborn child and a two-year-old. And we also had a plant. And I thought with all my financial knowledge, I would go into the financial industry. And I thought, hey, with my good looks and personality, I'm going to take this industry by storm. Where I really failed. I, I failed flat. First two years were horrible. I would never recommend people to take the same path that I took. And maybe that's something we can chat later. Uh, but 
also made me dive deep into uh, who I am, what works and what doesn't. And I, I have developed into a competent and confident business owner and leader. And for the first time really in my life, I can say I'm, I'm happy. I'm not always chasing squirrels or, or looking for the next big thing. I'm, I'm very content. And to me, the future seems bright, even here in 2022, when we, well, it's now 2023, when a lot of people are panicking, but um, I'm, I'm very content, I guess, is a way to look at it. Well, I think there's a lot that people can take away from your story, even just little micro lessons throughout there. And one of the things that I would like to chat about in a little bit, like some of the mistakes you made in the beginning, with your engineering background, did you ever consider engineers as a niche? Uh, I noticed that your niche on your website was consultants. Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, I did consider engineers. So generally, like so many people listening to this, you you realize when you're introduced to the financial industry, it's more or less throw anything on the wall and hope fun, something sticks. Go after family, friends, right? And mm -hmm. uh, wow, that that is... If I could turn back time, I I actually lost friends and I would say not as close to so many family members because of that. Well, it's just poor, bad advice. Maybe it works for a few. And I have seen it work for people, but it sure didn't work for me. Uh, I drank the Kool-Aid at the firm I work with. It wasn't until somehow, miraculously, we got the, my wife had a third child. And that helped me kind of take a, a bigger outlook on life on who do I want to be who do I want to surround myself with so I then branched out I left that firm branched out with an independent brokerage she was fantastic at marketing but there was one time we were sitting down with an engineering couple and she was having a real hard time with them and you know there's a running joke in the financial industry the worst clients are generally engineers right, right? yeah they're, that's what I was thinking yeah, they are. And they are. They're, 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 they're the worst. But I remember this couple asking great questions. And the lady that I was getting this training from was getting very flustered. But I felt them. You know, I was, I was listening to them. I, I, I had empathy for them. And that's one of the first times that I realized my empathy and my ability to listening was a strength. I always kind of felt it a weakness in this industry because, you know, you see some of these producers just go, 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 go. And I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to focus on engineers. And I did that for a year. <laughs> That's a, almost a year I'd like to have back again because it was very tough. Engineers are very analytical. Correct. Uh, yeah, they, totally. Yeah. They almost want to be the actuaries on a lot of those insurance products. Uh, but it did, it did make me a much better advisor. I know my products inside out because of the clients that I worked with and some of the clients that I lost. I branched out to consultants because I realized there's really two types of engineers. And, you know, I, I hate to be generic. And, of course, the 80-20 rule doesn't always work. But I would say 80% of engineers are extremely analytical. You give them a task to do, they're going to do awesome. Uh, but they're going to be very skeptical and they're not really team players where the other 20 percent are more business they're still analytical but they have the big picture they, they can see what's going on and they're majorly either managers leaders business owners or consultants and mm -hmm. i decided to focus on the consultants uh, being a consultant myself realize that there's a lot more to it there's a lot of questions about incorporating properly ways to invest inside and outside of your corporation and uh, uh, i love this world a lot more so that, that's the long version of that story where yes i did focus on engineers once and now you know the engineers still come to me even over that marketing campaign that's almost three years ago we we're focusing on engineers engineers still come and uh apply for my services well what's interesting about engineers that i've noticed because I don't have that much experience marketing to engineers. I've done a handful of campaigns over the years. I've noticed that if they know a lot about a subject, they can perform so much better than the average person, meaning they're excellent at their jobs. Or if it's structural engineer, for example, if it's information systems engineering, they know a lot about that particular area. They are incredible. But if they know just a little bit, meaning they don't know as much as you, the financial advisor, 
they can be incredibly dangerous because they don't know that they're being reckless with the little bit of information that they have. And there's a saying that people know just enough to be dangerous. And I, I don't think that's ever been more true than with engineers because they're so excellent at other stuff. They mistakenly believe that they can be excellent with the little itty bitty piece of financial information that they have. And it leads them astray. Oh, 100%. They're used to being top of their class. They're used to being best at their work. So they, they, a lot of them feel like they can do whatever they do better than the average Joe, which they're, they're right for the majority. But, you know, um, when you're an average Joe in the financial industry, yeah, maybe they can do better, but they can't do better than that. The best, the ones that actually take their job serious. Correct. So I think it's a smart move that you transition to consultants, especially since you are one. I think you mentioned this, that consultants tend to be some of the highest income earners. I would like, and if you didn't, it's like business owners, managers, these types of professions tend to be high income earners. So it, I think consultants is a wonderful niche. Is there anything you've done to market to consultants that has worked exceedingly well in the past few years? I would have to say... Uh... You know, we look at social media, LinkedIn has been real, real key for my growth with consultants, uh, just in the financial industry alone. Um, it's taken me a long time to get my LinkedIn to where I like it. You know, going back to the, some of the things that to do right and to do wrong when I first was introduced to the uh, financial industry, uh, planking at that wall with anything that sticks. That's how I treat it, LinkedIn. So, I joke around kind of a big deal on LinkedIn. I got about 14,000 followers, but really half of those, they don't serve me and I don't serve them. It's the, the latter, the last three or four years where I kind of really honed in on who my niche are in the States. Is it, what did you guys say in the States? Niche or niche? niche. People say both. I say niche, but both. only because it rhymes with rich. And I can't say the riches are in the niches and sound cool. <laughs> Uh, being from Halifax, we have more in common with the the uh, eastern states. Little known fact that we were the, the, known as the 14th colony a long time ago. We're this close, very close to joining the states. We, I think, decided to go with Canada. But anyways, that, that's beside the point. It, it, once you can get specific on what you, who you want to serve, just just avoid so much of the noise and distractions out there. And your content becomes more tailored to consultants. You can use the language that they use. You can talk about topics they're interested in. It just becomes more effective than just trying a broad-based market approach. 100%. And one of the things that works for me is you got to remember you're, you are talking to your ideal avatar or your client. I, I catch myself focusing on myself sometimes and talking about what's important to me. But if you can have, protect yourself from yourself from doing that and, and just keep focused on your avatar and like you're chatting with them, your, your marketing is going to be so much more powerful. Well, I think it's fine to talk about yourself and people need to see the human side of you. And even in the show, if you share it with your clients or potential clients, they're, they're going to hear about your children and your story and your journey. And it's going to be great. Some of the best performing content that I've seen personally and with other people, it, it tends to actually be about themselves, not all of the time. And it's even better if you can weave a story about yourself and your niche together. That works exceedingly well. When people visit your LinkedIn profile, is there a certain call to action that you have where you want them to take? Is it to send them to a landing page? Is it send them to your website? Is it to schedule an appointment? What exactly do you do through LinkedIn? So mainly I'll do a, a post and the majority of my posts follow the, the, the what's the main problem of my ideal client. Agitate that a little bit and then try to come across as the white knight. And then in my comment section, I always get them to go to visit my website with the idea that they'll click a 15 minute phone call to reach out. And that, that's, that. yeah, generally the, that's the process I use. And I, I have to say one of the things that, you know, 2022, um, I was remember this time last year, just getting that momentum. And then that army crom came around, right. And everything shut down again. I actually got COVID. So I was sick for most month of March. And, you know, typically in 
in my industry up here, the busy times are September to March, and then it kind of peters off. So I I focused on my marketing. So during the summertime, got some really cool commercials done. Got a, a, a marketing firm here to make my marketing look great. I knew what I wanted. And then hit the ground running in September. And having those commercials kind of play on auto replay with the the descriptions or posts of focusing on the problems. It's a big uptake in business, right? It uh not like I'm I'm killing it, but you know, sixty sixty thousand in the last four months of I've doing pretty much nothing is is to me a big deal. And, and one of the reasons why I consider myself a content and competent business owner now. So where are you placing the commercials? Is that social media, online ads? Almost 100% on LinkedIn. I do okay. uh, a little bit on Facebook and Instagram. That is the next step. And I'll probably be reaching out to you to make sure that this is done right. Because you know, <laughs> you can spend a ton of money on, on social media ads. I just want to make sure it's done right. And I feel like it's it's there. It can be tricky. There are, are there are certain things that used to work really well that don't work. I'm sure there are things that don't work today that are going to work in the future, either again or for the first time. You really do have to be on on top of these things. But that's interesting. Um, I love the idea of a commercial video marketing has been a, a huge trend in 2022, and I'm sure it'll continue to be that way in 2023, simply because people enjoy seeing a human face, hearing a human voice, hearing a story. Just like something like this podcast, even though it's only going to be in audio, I'm I'm sure I'll give you the video so you can use it if you want to. But people will primarily listen to your voice and hear you. And that's something I wish more advisors did. I wish advisors take this away. I want them to take this away from the episode that here's something that you're sharing that they can model, that they can use. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You take these commercials that worked elsewhere, like Steve Jobs is uh, here's to the crazy ones commercial. And just change the words. I did exactly that and uh, was advised to do that. And it, and it seems to be working. Yes. I've I've done the exact same thing in the past with online ads, with video scripts. That's exactly what it is. When you were describing like the, you have a problem and then you agitate a little bit. For those of you who don't know, that's a classic copywriting formula called problem agitate solve. Uh, it was made famous, I believe, by either Dan Kennedy or Gary Halbert. None of this is important. Um, but it is a formula that tends to work. People are like, oh, how do I write an email? Well, start with the problem, then agitate a little bit, then solve it. Well, how do I post on social media? You start with the problem, agitate it, solve it. Now, of course, every strength overextended becomes a weakness, but that is a great starting point, And that's something that people can do. Hey, financial advisors. If you'd like even more help building your business, I invite you to subscribe to James's monthly paper and ink newsletter, The James Pollard Inner Circle. When you join today, you'll get more than $1,000 worth of bonuses, including exclusive interviews that aren't available anywhere else. Head on over to theadvisorcoach.com slash coaching to learn more. I want to shift gears a little bit here. And I went to your website. And one of the things I want to commend you for doing is that your website has a book, a call button, call to action in the header of your website. There's not really like flashy pictures, irrelevant text. You explain who you are and it says book a call. And I love that. What? But here's the thing that I don't see. I don't see what happens after people book a call with you. Is there a certain sequence? Is there a thank you page? What happens after people book the call? Generally, after they book a call, we'll have a 15-minute conversation. And this is really a qualifying conversation to see, A, do I want to work with them? B, do they want to work with me? So just simple questions. Um, get to know one another. Generally, you know, I ask them if they've worked with other advisors before. What's their... You know, what's their experience with that? And then kind of show how we're different. And if we both agree, we decide, hey, let's have a complimentary discovery meeting. And mm -hmm. this is where we usually will do this over Zoom. Or if the person wants to meet face to face, we'll do that. That's one thing I've learned is, you know, do what the client wants. If they want to meet over Zoom, let's do that. If they want to meet face to face, no problem, unless we're in different provinces or different countries. Bit of an issue there. This this is then a really a getting clear on their vision values goals taken directly almost right from Bill Bacharach's uh, value based financial planning just modified a little bit 
And that's where we get crystal clear on what they actually want. And this comes back to the listening and empathy. And, you know, a lot of financial advisors talk about goals, but they gloss over them or don't really even get that deep into what people's goals are. And this is where I think we, we, it shows the difference that we actually, we're going to work on a plan that's based on what you actually want. And generally at the end of that meeting, we, uh, we give the options. We show, okay, based on your conversation, this is what, what the planning options I think that would be best for you. We discuss fees and uh, we ought to carry on or we don't. More often, we seem to be carrying on after, after that original discovery meeting. Well, that's because you qualify so well and you explain yeah. who you want, who you are. I am curious though, because I see a lot of financial advisors jump immediately to like the one hour discovery meeting, as you call it, or the initial consultation or whatever name they have for it. They try to jump right into an hour meeting. Advice that I've given is to start with 15 minutes, like you're describing here. Unfortunately, I don't have any studies or research to back that up. I only have anecdotal evidence from financial advisors who say that it's working. Have you always done 15 minutes to begin with? Or was there a point in time where you tried 30 minutes or an hour and you you shifted? In terms of 100, I agree with you on that. I did try to jump from not have that 15 minute phone call and jump right to the discovery meeting. And then just there didn't seem to be anybody raising their hands where more people raise their hands for the 15 minutes. And when they have a discussion with you, realize you're a good person, it's almost, I would say, close to 100% go to that discovery meeting after the phone call, unless it's close to 100%. Mm -hmm. And then I would say after the discovery meeting, it's anywhere between 75 to maybe 60 where we proceed with planning. Well, I have a lot of hypotheses or hypotheses for why that is. I think the most prominent is that asking for an hour immediately is very intimidating to people. I think that number two, asking for an hour right away sends the signal that you're going to try to quote unquote, close them on that call. That is like a sales call. People almost think with the 15 minutes, like there's no way is he's going to try to sell me anything. He, he can't sell quote unquote, I'm using the finger quotes for the podcast listeners. Um, he can't sell anything, a uh, products, a service, a financial plan in 15 minutes. But the idea isn't necessarily to sell. It's to see if, if the financial advisor wants to work with you. It's not that <laughs> the other way around. It's trying to get rid of you, get you out of the process if necessary. And it is a huge time saver. But let's say that someone doesn't end up working with you as a client and they drop out either after the 15 minute phone call or after the one hour discovery meeting. Do you have any sort of follow up process for those people? Yeah, we generally have an email marketing campaign, We're sent sequent messages. Just to follow up, and that is over. I want to say it, it's a four month follow up. So it, they are getting an email every two weeks, and we do see some success. What, people come back after and say, "Okay, let's let's chat." But yes, that, I guess that was one of my major weaknesses. I, I discovered was following up. So I got myself a CRM with those with the emails, automated emails. Update those ever so often. It's amazing what you think works uh, a year ago. You reread them. <laughs> you realize, you no, know, uh, a lot of things change in a year. So you got to make sure that they're updated. And uh, it's a great way to follow up. Well, what's in, I, full disclosure, I love email marketing. That is probably the thing I'm most well known for outside of the newsletter is the email marketing stuff. I personally email daily. I do the autoresponder thing. It's incredible. The return on investment is absurd. The problem though, people don't really think about this. And here I am, I'm going to kind of bash email marketing a little bit, but in a good way, I promise. You can't take like $100,000 and put it into email marketing and get the same 44X return. So you're not going to make $4.4 million immediately like you would with 100 bucks or with 200 because you get the sequence and the software and you uh, all the goodies that come with it. But Email is a wonderful tool for reducing skepticism. If people just aren't ready when you are, rarely do all the stars align. So I think it's wonderful that you have a way to systematically, automatically follow up with prospective clients after they have already met with you. They just need a little bit more time. They need a little bit more information. And 
email is the way to, to do it. Another thing I want to point out, and I promise I'll shut up after this, is you pointed out that some things don't work a year later. One of the things that I think you would agree with me on is that email comes with a lot of data. And you can look back over the course of a year and use that data to see what really is working based on numbers in an account in your CRM, for example, and tweak based on that. Do you, is that what you're implying or is that what you do? You just change over time? One, one, 100%. You see what's working, what's not. One of the reasons I love LinkedIn too, you can see the impressions that you're supposed to make and what very easy to do. you know. And then you can repost those or just change them up a little bit and redo and, and see how that goes so it's i had a real issue of picking up the phone i think i you know, look my first year in the financial industry i tried to do it my way failed then listened to the firm said listen do it do it our way so i did it their way picked up the phone failed and was miserable doing so <laughs> so i've looked for any other way how can i grow my business without having to pick up the phone. And the truth is you you do have to pick up your phone, but you can have four or five different ways of growing your business. It just can't be one and right. done. Correct. Right. That's a, You're speaking my language. That is 100% in line with what I believe. Uh, I do want to give financial advisors a takeaway. So he mentioned that you can see you, the uh, impressions and view counts and everything. I'm going to see if I can get this right here. Uh, financial advisors, if you have the LinkedIn app, what I want you to do is I want you to go to your profile page in the LinkedIn app. Do it right now while you're listening to the show. Go to your profile and then underneath of your profile image, your header, and it should say how many followers or connections you have. Underneath that, you're going to see a section called analytics. In the analytics, the first section is profile views. Then you have post impressions. I want you to click on the part that says post impressions. Then you get to the area where it tells you how your content has performed. The default is over the last seven days, but you can change that to 365 days, 90 days, uh, whatever tickles your fancy. So scroll down on the mobile app and you will see it tells you top performing post over whatever time period you've selected. So if you've selected 365 days, LinkedIn will spoon feed you your most successful post over the past year. And I don't see the option on the mobile app, but I know you can, oh, it's at the top. So at the top, you can change from impressions to engagements. And you see which one's got the most impressions, which one's got the most likes and comments. And just as Steve told you here is absolute gold, you can reuse that content. So I love that you're doing that, by the way. Yeah, I wish I'd done more of it, but I will continue to do. So one of my most uh, top performing posts last year was about a news anchor that got fired here because she uh, didn't dye her hair. She, oh no! She grew her hair gray, and more or less saying the news is shitty. Anyways, you don't need to watch the news. Focus on what's important, and that's got uh, over thirteen thousand impressions. Wow! So people don't realize that, that as an online advertiser, as I spend a boatload of money on ads. So when people say, "Oh, my LinkedIn profile only got fifty thousand impressions over the last ninety days," I'm like, "Do you realize what I would have to pay?" to get 50,000 impressions for a high quality audience. It's it's easy to get 50,000 impressions if you just choose like Bangladesh or India or Mexico or Egypt, the entire United States or all of Canada. If you choose like a large country, that's easy. But if you're talking about a specific audience of consultants, engineers, attorneys, doctors, whatever, which your LinkedIn should be, as you've mentioned, you it didn't used to be that way, but now you're connecting with consultants and growing your audience there. For me to get 50,000, for example, impressions, I would have to fork up some serious money through online ads. So it's it's a gold mine if it's used correctly. Uh, I uh, can't imagine what people did before social media. <laughs> they made phone calls. Especially as LinkedIn. Yeah. One of the analogies that I like to use with cold calls, and I think this might make you laugh and it might make financial advisors laugh who are listening. If it's not in your personality, I highly recommend not doing it. Don't fight your personality. It's not something that I enjoy. The analogy is that cows find it very difficult to walk downstairs. For a long time, people believed that cows could not walk downstairs because they were so hesitant to do so. They can do it if you force them. If you get behind a cow and push it and just push and really make that cow force it to go downstairs, their legs just aren't built for the movement. It's very awkward 
to them. They haven't evolved. They haven't grown to be able to do the the weird contortion that comes from walking down the stairs. Humans do it very easily because it's just a flexible, it's a not flexible, but it's a moving joint. Cows have a whole, a whole bunch of joints and problems with it. It's not in their nature is what I'm trying to say. And if it's not in your nature to do public speaking, to make phone calls, to even do like cold email, for example, then I highly recommend not doing it. And I think you're a master class in someone who discovered what he didn't like, cold calls, phone calls, and shifted to something that is actually working for you and working well. So I, I commend you for that. Appreciate that. And I wish I heard that advice several years ago. It would have saved me years of torment. You know, looking back, that's I just came across a young, he's more of an insurance agent, but he's a young whippersnapper and he, he's he he's got no problem with the cold calls and knocking on doors. He's six months in and he's already making over six figures, well, five figures a month. And he doesn't realize it, how difficult for me to do exactly what he's doing. I couldn't do it and I can't do it. And you're right. So, but he can, and it does work for some, but I would say for the majority, it doesn't. Yeah, it's because it's just difficult. I used to train when I was a consultant. I guess I still am, even though I rarely do it. But when I was actively earning income from consulting, and it was a large part of my income, <laughs> um, I took an engagement with a major bank. This bank is based out of uh, Buffalo, New York. It's got two letters in the name. It's one letter and another letter, bank. And I did some consulting in the call center here in Delaware. and. I must have listened to thousands of cold calls and I must have made hundreds just over and over and over for multiple products, for credit cards, for mortgage payments or mortgages, for refinances, for everything under the sun that this bank offered. And I saw it clearly that some people just were naturally better at it than other people. And people like to argue and say, oh, well, you can train for that. Yes, you can. But you're training someone who is, let's just say, a five out of 100 to get to 10 out of 100. But someone else could walk in the door and be at 35. And when I train that person, it's gonna that person's going to go to 75 out of 100. That person is so far ahead of the, the, the other one where the personality doesn't align with cold calls. I, I, I don't even try. And when I explained that to the people at this bank, they told me that was like a defeatist attitude. And I was like, well, let's just try it. Just like the person told you, well, let's try it my way. That's what I did. I was like, well, let's try it my way. And they tightened up their hiring process because at this point, they just, it was, it's a call center. Let's just be real. They just wanted to take on anybody with a pulse to make these calls, to make money for the bank. That was what their, their mindset was, was just get somebody in the seat. But if they went, when I got them to slow down, think about what they were doing, role play with people. That's a big deal. When you role play in the interview process, they weren't doing that. God knows why. When I got them to do that, the results went through the roof. And unfortunately, people don't like to hear that. There are lots of sales trainers who don't like to hear that, but I'm just saying that's been my experience. And I'm, I'm happy that we were able to talk about that because I'm sure that this has helped a, a lot of advisors. I hope it has. I hope it has. Yeah. If I could do it all again, like I remember when I was looking and going to the financial industry, there was an old, an old fella. He said, listen, find an old fellow like me, uh, train under him and, uh, buy his book of business you're off to the races and that was good advice at the time i was like whatever old man i'm going to do it my way i'm going to join this this crappy firm and uh, change the world you know for people that are getting brand new into the business i i guess that's the advice i'd recommend to them find an old go to the bank where you're getting paid find someone that's successful with the mind and game that you're going to go independent and you're going to focus on customer service but there's two things that I wish I knew better when I started off. And one is knowing thyself, getting crystal clear on who you are. And that's not just filling out a personality test, but actually really knowing and that that's going to be hard. That That's harder to do than say, it, there's going to be some tears coming out and your, your weaknesses will probably end up being your strengths and your strengths will probably end up being your weaknesses. And you'll find out a whole brand new, yourself. And when you do that, you can get crystal clear on your ideal client. And that just, that's going to save you so much time. So I guess a final question I have for you, and then we'll wrap things up. We've already touched on this a little bit, but I want to give you a chance to answer the question like explicitly like with this on your mind. 
over the course of, I believe you since, said since 2014 is when you began focusing on consultants. Is that correct? I would, 2014 is kind of when I was getting into the business. I would okay. say I focused on consultants two years ago only. Okay. Well, I'll stick with 2014. So since 2014, aside from everything that you've shared, which has been amazing, and I hope financial advisors take this to heart, are there any other ways that your overall business has evolved? Any big seismic shifts that have occurred? Mainly, I think because I failed so much at first and was I don't really upset, you know, going back to that engineering thing where we're supposed to know more and supposed to make less mistakes. I was really upset with myself for joining that original firm that I was with. Like, how could I be so stupid? So it made me second guess everything I did. And I think, you know, that's a blessing in, in disguise. You don't have to go through the school of hard rocks. I, I sure did. Um, but it made me sure, okay, if I'm going to pursue something, I'm going to know it inside out. And that's both been a big help. It's also been a huge hindrance to the growth of my business. Um, trying to figure everything out on your own. I don't recommend that route necessarily. Uh, but what really started growing my business was getting crystal clear on the marketing. And again, if, if I could have done it all again, I would have worked with someone like you right away. Someone that's in the financial business because it's very different from marketing and trying to sell a ton of stuff. And I guess you got to decide what route you want. Do you want to be a product pusher or do you want to have 50 good clients? What route do you want to go with? The route I want to go with is very different than pushing and, and working. It's it's just small bites at a time. I, I like it a lot more. I got my life back and I guess that's that's the big staple is try instead of trying to please everyone, just find out who you actually want to work with and provide value and answers and solutions to them. So when you're happy, when you feel better about yourself, when you enjoy the work that you're doing, you become so much better at it. That's an amazing takeaway. Final question. If people want to get in touch with you, how can they do so? I've got my the website. I market myself as the financial engineer where I help people design Better Futures. My website is designanevenbetterfuture.com. You can book a call there. My email is there as well. Designabetterfuture.com. Design and okay. proper English and, and even better future. And even, and even. There you go. <laughs> and even. A N for the vowel that comes after. That is wonderful. Design and even better future.com. I love that domain, by the way. And financial advisors, I hope you have enjoyed this episode. A lot of good takeaways from a financial advisor who is sharing what is working for him now, what hasn't worked. It's just, there's a ton of gold in this episode. And with that said, I will catch you next week. This is the podcastfactory.com. 